Hello, greetings to everyone. It is a pleasure uh, to take part uh, in this year's edition of the Eurasia Foundation Cross-Cultural Dialogues. And I would like to thank uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Asuncio Lopez Varela, for her kind invitation uh, to uh, be part of this series of lectures and uh, to give uh, the, the final talk uh, of this uh, year's uh, series. Uh, for this final talk, I have uh, decided to focus on ethics and I will be uh, talking about ethics from the Hinduist per perspective. I think uh, that uh, in our current world, uh, um, uh, it is important uh, to have uh, other points of view uh, when we have to face important problems, such as uh, the ones that we have to face nowadays, specifically uh, within uh, these uh, pandemics that uh, we are uh, living. Uh, but uh, also for other uh, pressing and important uh, issues that we have to deal with in our uh, globalized uh, world. I, I assume that uh, most of you will be familiar with uh, ethics from a Western uh, perspective, that is the perspective of ethics that we find in Western philosophy and in Western uh, religions, uh, specifically uh, from a Christian point of view, but I assume that not uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, Hinduist ethics. That's why I have decided to focus on this, because it can, he it can help to bring uh, uh, new perspectives and to shed light into uh, uh, ways and to, to help us find ways to solve uh, important problems, problems that uh, we have to face in our uh, current uh, world. Hinduism, as uh, most of you know, is one of the oldest uh, religions of the world. It originated in India and it, its roots go back uh, to the second millennium BC. Uh, because Hinduism uh, is an outcome of uh, the Vedic tradition and uh, some of the Vedic texts uh, that uh, have, have come to us must have originated in the uh, last centuries of the second millennium BC. But uh, Hinduism, what we specifically call Hinduism, um, took shape uh, about uh, the 6th and 5th uh, centuries BC in India. It was a time of uh, important uh, religious uh, changes in India and uh, more, more or less about the same time uh, three uh, important uh, Indian religions originated, not only Hinduism but also Buddhism and Jainism. Uh, the main difference between uh, them is that uh, Hinduism um, considers uh, sacred uh, the Vedic texts while uh, Jainism and, um, and more, important, or more importantly uh, Buddhism uh, does uh, not recognize the sacrality of the uh, Vedic text. In that way it is a bit like uh, Christianism uh, when faced to Judaism. I mean Christianism is not Judaism but, in, uh, but Christians uh, uh, consider sacred uh, the text of the Old Testament that is uh, the, the sacred text of the, of the Jews. Uh, therefore, it is something similar to uh, what we find in India. Uh, although uh, Hinduism changed importantly uh, views about uh, religion and about human life and everything, but nevertheless, what they try to do is to uh, give new interpretations to the old sacred text of the India uh, under this new light. Instead of saying, okay, we don't uh, believe in this text anymore, that's what, what the Buddhists uh, did, but uh, Hindus um, uh, continue to uh, accept the sacrality of those texts and to uh, use them uh, for their religious purposes. Uh, I will begin uh, by uh, discussing some uh, important concepts in Hinduism since the time of the Upanishads. The Upanishads, as, uh, uh, the Upanishads are a very important uh, text for the history of Hinduism. Uh, they are dialogues, specifically dialogues, uh, well, usually between a, a, a guru and his disciples, uh, in which uh, they discuss uh, different uh, subjects, all of them uh, pertaining to religion. They range uh, from uh, the specific specificities of rituals to complicated uh, philosophical and religious uh, matters. We will be focusing on these uh, more uh, philosophical aspects of the uh, Upanishads, uh, and in this uh, we have to be aware that we are making uh, an abstraction because uh, in the Upanishads, in this uh, important text, all of these matters uh, sometimes 
uh, usually uh, come uh, together. They are all mixed because uh, when a guru is uh, providing explanations, uh, for instance, about a ritual uh, to his disciples, he may introduce information about uh, uh, the origins of that ritual, about uh, the meaning of the different uh, actions performed uh, during the ritual, but also uh, he may provide information about uh, important aspects of philosophy and religion. And it is these uh, uh, more philosophical aspects that have uh, attracted more uh, attention from Western uh, uh, thinkers and from uh, Western scholars because uh, they open a window to a, a, a way of thinking that is really radically different from uh, what we find in the Western tradition. Uh, the Upanishads um, uh, tell us that uh, um, the world is basically suffering and they, uh, they uh, say uh, this because uh, all the information uh, that comes uh, to us uh, through our senses uh, speaks uh, about uh, the uh, non-durability, the uh, perishable character of uh, all the things uh, that uh, we live uh, together with. It is in this sense that uh, they speak about uh, this uh, dukkha, existential suffering, and it is because of, of this that they define uh, the world as change. Uh, they call the world Jagat, uh, what moves, uh, they call it uh, Prakriti, transformation, uh, as you can see, they emphasize the idea of change and continuous movement because nothing that uh, we per uh, perceive uh, through our senses uh, it will stay there forever. Everything is going to change and everything is going to disappear in the end. Uh, every uh, every uh, living being is going to die, so nothing is going to stay. And therefore, they ask uh, themselves a key question. And that key question is... Uh, uh, whether there is a universal true or a universal reality. As you can see, I have put uh, this uh, double translation, true and reality, for just one word in Sanskrit, satya, uh, because uh, this Sanskrit word, satya, means uh, both things at the same time. It is reality, but it is also true, because uh, what we see, what we hear, what we perceive uh, uh, with our senses, uh, we cannot be sure uh, whether it is true or not, uh, because uh, it is basically de deception. And that's an important concept, because uh, we shouldn't uh, let ourselves to be deceived and believe that uh, what we uh, get uh, with our senses is real, because it is not. Uh, the answer uh, to that question, uh, whether there is a universal uh, reality and truth, uh, is different in Buddhism and in Hinduism. Uh, for the Buddhists, the answer will be no. There is uh, no such thing as a universal truth. But uh, for the Hindus, uh, the answer is positive. They say that there is a universal truth and it is that universal truth and reality that provides an explanation that uh, it is the basis, uh, it is the support that uh, explains uh, uh, this uh, universe. But uh, that universal truth, uh, we cannot uh, see it, we cannot uh, hear it, uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, have access to it through our senses and therefore uh, they have to find a way to, to refer to it. Uh, uh, they call it Brahman. Brahman is a very old word in Sanskrit. Uh, it was already used uh, in previous times in Vedic. Uh, its original meaning was uh, something like prayer, a religious prayer. Uh, but uh, from the time of the, uh, the Upanishads on, uh, it began to be used uh, uh, for uh, referring to this universal truth and reality. They also uh, uh, use terms like Tad, uh, it's simply a pronoun meaning that, or also tad ekam, uh, that one, the one, uh, emphasizing the, the unity of this universal truth. They also call it tad anantan, uh, the unlimited, uh, but uh, um, uh, we don't have uh, to, um, um, to think about uh, this uh, as uh, something negative, because uh, this uh, unlimited character character uh, means that uh, the Brahman occupies everything, is everything, is the absolute uh, unity. 
and they also uh, call it nirguna. Nirguna means lacking any quality, and this is uh, this is not negative either, uh, because uh, uh, what it means is that it cannot have, it doesn't have uh, any of the qualities that uh, we are used to. I mean, we cannot tell uh, that it is uh, short nor long, we cannot tell that it is new or old, uh, we cannot tell that it is uh, tall or, or short, we cannot uh, say anything about it and therefore it must be defined as lacking any quality because uh, telling any adjective about uh, this uh, ultimate uh, reality will be misguiding. Uh, we would be uh, using uh, improper terms because it cannot be defined with the usual terms that we uh, employ when we want to define the uh, allegedly the supposed reality that we live uh, in. Here I have put uh, three more additional concepts that uh, it is important to take into account when uh, trying to understand uh, Hinduism and Hindu ethics. Uh, the first one is the concept of samsara, the cycle of rebirth. Uh, in Hinduism, as uh, in all the religions uh, that originated in India, it is believed that uh, we are uh, uh, that after we die we are uh, re uh, reborn uh, again and again until we are able to reach liberation from this cycle of rebirths and that is one of the most important goals of human life according to hinduism it is called moksha in sanskrit and moksha means specifically this liberation from the cycle of rebirths uh, since, uh, I mean, we have uh, seen before that um, uh, existence is considered uh, in the Upanishads uh, as basically suffering. Therefore, uh, the goal would be to get free from this uh, suffering and the only way to get free from it is not being born anymore. But this is not something uh, easy to achieve because uh, we will see uh, in the next uh, diapos uh, that uh, the, the ways uh, to reach liberation are not so easy. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we have to uh, take into account that it would be impossible for a human being to achieve such a great uh, uh, achievement as uh, being uh, freed from the cycle of liberation. And this can only be done because there is a part of the Brahman uh, you remember that we have uh, already uh, seen that Brahman is the, the Sanskrit name for uh, the universal truth and reality. And uh, there is a part of that Brahman uh, that uh, is in each human being uh, and it is called Atman. Some people translate that as a uh, soul, but uh, it is not exactly the same as soul uh, as we think of it in our Western tradition. Because if you st stop to, th to think about it, uh, uh, in Christianity, for instance, in Christianism, uh, soul and God are absolutely different. Uh, therefore, uh, we cannot say that uh, soul is God and God is soul because that would be heresy uh, for uh, any uh, Christian faith. Um, contrary to that, in Hinduism, uh, this part of the Atman uh, uh, that uh, is inside each human being is considered to be identical with the Brahman. That is, Atman and Brahman are the same uh, reality and it is only a uh, they are only two different ways of referring to the same reality. Uh, Brahman emphasizes the idea of universal truth and the idea of a universal reality, while Atman emphasizes the idea that that universal reality resides, uh, is found also inside each uh, human uh, being. Since uh, life is basically suffering, suffering uh, then uh, it is no wonder that uh, the most uh, important uh, concern or the highest goal of human life uh, for a Hindu is reaching uh, liberation from the cycle of rebirths. Uh, in the oldest uh, Upanishads, uh, there was only one way of uh, um, reaching this liberation and uh, it is what we call Jnana Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge. Uh, it is uh, basically the idea that if, if we look in our inner self, if we reflect about this, if we uh, focus on this, then we will finally realize that uh, that uh, inner self, uh, that Atman that is inside each of us, is uh, only part of the universal 
uh, unity of the universal reality and truth. That is, we will be able to realize that uh, Atman is part of the Brahman. And this uh, intuition, this knowledge, uh, will uh, free us uh, from the cycle of reverts. As you can imagine, uh, people soon realized that it was very difficult to reach liberation in this way because uh, not so many people uh, um, had the uh, capacity of uh, arriving at that, uh, at that knowledge, at that intuition and being able uh, to uh, uh, liberate themselves from the cycle of reverts. And therefore, uh, since the times of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, you have the name uh, uh, in the upper part of this uh, diapo, um, they uh, assume that there were other possibilities to reach liberation. They speak about the Jnana Yoga, the Karma Yoga and the Bhakti Yoga. Uh, the Karma Yoga is based uh, uh, on the idea that uh, given that we, we have to live in this world uh, because uh, we have been born, uh, and living in this, in this world means that we have to uh, to do things, uh, to uh, to do actions. What we should do is not to uh, what we sh what we should try to do is to avoid being tainted or polluted by the actions that we have to do. Uh, that is, uh, we have to to eat. We have to uh, earn money uh, to uh, uh, for our family, for our children, and for ourselves. We have uh, to do our uh, uh, everyday course, and uh, we have to live. Uh, so. Uh, we run the risk of uh, being um, uh, polluted by these actions. And uh, what we should do is uh, to uh, have a behavior that uh, doesn't uh, cause uh, this pollution. How uh, can th this be possible? Uh, the, the answer is the Karma Yoga. Uh, you, have, uh, you can see uh, on the diapo that I have translated uh, Karma Yoga as Yoga of Action. That is the literal meaning, but uh, we should interpret it in the way uh, that I have uh, put uh, also in the, on the diapo. Uh, it is the yoga of unselfish action. That is um, what underlies Karma Yoga is the idea that we should uh, do our duty uh, and we shouldn't be thinking about uh, the results and the benefits uh, of our actions uh, because uh, in that way uh, we won't be polluted by, by our actions. While if we are thinking about what we are going to obtain or what we are going, what profit we are going to to take uh, when doing something, then we will be polluted uh, by our actions, and the punishment will be that we will be reborn again uh, after we die. After we die, and remember that this is considered punishment because uh, uh, living is suffering. That's the basic idea uh, for uh, Hinduism. And then there is a, a third possibility, the Bhakti Yoga, the Yoga of Devotion, and it is the idea that uh, we are uh, 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 limited because uh, we are uh, just uh, human beings and therefore we are not going to be able to reach liberation by ourselves and uh, we need the help of a God, of a divinity. And uh, if we uh, attach ourselves to this uh, divinity by way of devotion, by uh, offering uh, uh, sacrifices and by uh, establishing a, a, a relation uh, with uh, the divinity, it will be the divinity that will uh, free us uh, from the uh, cycle of reverts. These three ways uh, to achieve liberation uh, can be found in uh, Indian uh, thought and in Indian literatures in the times of the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is one of the uh, most important texts uh, for Hinduism. Uh, it is uh, part of the uh, great uh, Indian epic poem, the Mahabharata. And uh, it is uh, the god uh, uh, Vishnu himself in one of uh, his avatars. Uh, the word avatar means descent and it refers specifically in this context to the descents of uh, the god Vishnu to the earth. Uh, in uh, in this, uh, this sense, he incarnates in different uh, 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 men or uh, in, in different characters. And in this time, uh, he has come to the earth as uh, the king uh, Krishna. The king Krishna uh, has accepted to take part in the final battle that will destroy 
eh, de, eh, the Royal Family of India, eh, but eh, he has told that he won't be eh, eh, fighting, that eh, he will be on one of the sides, but eh, he won't be eh, using eh, weapons. Eh, One of uh, the, 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 the chief of one of the uh, two parties, uh, Arjuna, uh, has uh, accepted uh, to have him on, on his uh, side, uh, uh, even if he's not going to, uh, to take uh, the weapons and to fight uh, in, the, in the final battle. But uh, he knows that, uh, in fact, uh, Krishna is Lord Vishnu, and um, before entering the battle, Uh, it is uh, 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 he, uh, Arjuna, uh, the, the chief of one of the two parties, uh, will have the advice of the god uh, Vishnu, uh, of the uh, king Krishna. And uh, it is in this context, before uh, going into the battle, that uh, Krishna will reveal this important knowledge uh, to uh, Arjuna. And he will uh, speak about the three ways to reach liberation, and from this time on, they will be accepted generally in uh, Hinduism. Another import important question is how this can be reconciled with a uh, normal life. Because if you have to devote yourself uh, to uh, reaching liberation, then how can you live? Uh, the answer is here, in the four stages of life or ashramas. Uh, maybe you have uh, heard the word ashram because uh, many people that go to India uh, searching for uh, spirituality, uh, many of them will go to an ashram. Uh, an ashram is usually a, a place where there is a guru and people get together in order to follow his teachings. But originally ashram, uh, ashrama in Sanskrit, uh, means, uh, refers to uh, each of the four stages of life that Uh, every uh, man, and uh, I, I emphasize this, every man, because uh, this doesn't apply for, woman, for women uh, in ancient India, uh, uh, it, it refers, the word ashram, to these uh, four stages of life that uh, every man belonging to one of the uh, upper caste has to go through uh, over uh, his life. Uh, the first uh, stage is the stage of Rakmacharin, or a uh, Vedic student. Uh, it is the part of life that, it is, devo that is devoted to uh, learning uh, all that has to do uh, with religion. Uh, the, um, the, the young man or uh, the, the, uh, the teen has to go with a guru and the guru will teach him uh, the, the prayers and all uh, uh, that he needs to, to know about religion because Um, um, in, in India, in ancient India, the, um, uh, the, the husband uh, will uh, perform religious uh, rites and will have to, uh, to be responsible of uh, certain rites uh, uh, for the family. Uh, he will also uh, learn the, the, the Gayatri, uh, that is the most important prayer for Hindus, and uh, he will also uh, um, know about uh, what will have to do, what he will have to do uh, when uh, he, he reaches uh, an older age and uh, he feels that uh, uh, death is uh, near him. The second stage is uh, the stage of Grihasta or householder. It is the longer stage in life because uh, when uh, the Brahmacharya com comes back uh, what he, uh, to his family, what he has to do is to find a, a, a girl. Well, in fact, he won't uh, find her because uh, in ancient India and uh, in many cases uh, in modern India, uh, marriages are arranged. So it will be his family that will find a suitable uh, uh, woman for her, but he will spend uh, most of his life as Grihasta, householder. Uh, during he, this stage he will have to take care of uh, his family, he will have uh, to, uh, to work uh, in what, in what uh, is, um, uh, I mean, uh, we will see uh, later that uh, uh, jobs in India Uh, depends on your caste, so you, you cannot choose, but you will have to uh, um, provide a means of living for your family, for your wife and for your children. Then, uh, then comes a third uh, stage uh, as Banaprasta or Hermit. 
And uh, the ancient texts say that uh, when uh, your hair is uh, uh, white and your children uh, are grown uh, grown ups, then uh, you have to leave uh, the uh, the village and you have to go to the forest and uh, start thinking about your spiritual life. Start uh, like uh, getting away uh, from uh, your uh, usual life and start to think about uh, religious uh, matters and start to to think about uh, uh, what is important for your life uh, in order not to be reborn again. This is the stage as Banaprasta or Hermit. Um, since um, you have to go to the forest, it was um, a frequent that uh, uh, different uh, people uh, got together and lived together in the forest uh, away from the villages in order to focus on uh, religious thinking and on religious uh, practice. This is, also, this is uh, only compulsory for men. Uh, it is uh, considered a, a good uh, act that uh, women go to the forest with their husbands, but it is not compulsory for them. They can choose to stay uh, in the village uh, with uh, her children instead of going to the forest uh, with their husbands. And finally, uh, the fourth stage is the stage of Samnyasin or Asset, and it is the final stage of life. Uh, when uh, you feel that um, death is is close to you, then uh, you should uh, try to uh, cut all the links that you have to the to the world and to focus on your inner self, to focus on your Atman, and therefore you have the possibility that uh, when you die you won't be uh, reborn again if you have enabled uh, to reach liberation by arriving at that illumination, at that special knowledge that uh, frees you from the uh, cycle of uh, rebirth. The ancient uh, Hindu text provide also an important hierarchy of the four Purusharthas or fundamental goals of life. Uh, the highest one is Moksha, we have already told that, uh, deliverance, uh, liberation from the cycle of rebirth, but they also consider Part of the four fundamental goals of life, harma, duty, and this will be a word that, will be, that we will be discussing in a, in a moment. Uh, they also consider important artha, wealth, uh, and that is um, uh, important to, um, uh, to say because uh, many people think of India are, uh, as a, basically a, a spiritual country and not focus on wealth and you can see that wealth is one of the four fundamental goals of uh, the life of, uh, of a man uh, as uh, it is also Kama, love, uh, because uh, sexuality is not forbidden in India. In fact, uh, it is part of your duty, of your dharma, uh, to have children and for that uh, you have to, to, practice, uh, to practice sex, obviously. And uh, in, if a man uh, refuses uh, to have children, he is not fulfilling his dharma and therefore he won't be able to reach uh, a deliverance, a deliberation of the cycle of rebirths. So even if this is a hierarchy, but uh, you cannot skip any of them. You have to find an appropriate balance between the four fundamentals in order to reach liberation, but in order to fulfill your, har your uh, dharma, your duty, uh, and your duty covers all uh, these uh, four fundamental goals. This is very interesting because it is not a, an ethics of exclusion like, uh, like uh, we uh, can see sometimes in other religions, but an ethics of inclusion, of finding an appropriate uh, balance between all the uh, things uh, that you are expected to do uh, over uh, your life. Dharma is a key word in Hinduism. I have translated it here as religious duty, but it is not only that. It is also translated sometimes as law, directly law, uh, simply duty. And basically it is the idea that you have to know what your place in the world is and behave accordingly. That is the basic idea of dharma. Know what your place in the world is and behave accordingly. And therefore, uh, dharma depends on your personal uh, situation, on your circumstances. There is uh, what they call the, swa the, the, the swat dharma, the behavior that is appropriate for one's jati or station. Jati is uh, uh, the name for a, a kind of subcast. I will be coming back to this later. 
there is also the idea of uh, ashram dharma. We have already uh, discussed the idea of ashrama, uh, the stage of life. And what you have to do is different when you are a, a Vedic student, when you are a husband or a householder, or when uh, you are in your final stage of life and you have to focus on uh, meditation and on uh, self-reflection. Therefore, your uh, duty will be different. And this is very important because it's radically different from what we are used to in, uh, in Western uh, thought. There is also the idea of Kula Dharma, the behavior that is appropriate uh, for your family. And uh, there is also this concept of uh, Apadharma, the behavior that is appropriate in a moment of crisis. And that can therefore uh, allow uh, you to do things that you are not usually expected to do or you are uh, expected not to do uh, in under normal circumstances. You can see that uh, therefore Hindu ethics is a uh, sensitive to the context and that is a very very important uh, difference from western ethics if you stop to think uh, when we discuss uh, the ten commandments uh, in in the christian tradition uh, there are no ten commandments for children the uh, the ten commandments are not different for women the ten commandments are not different from elder people and for for younger for younger people there are the, there are ten commandment ten commandments and they are the same for everyone uh, mm, we find the uh, the same uh, within a western uh, philosophical tradition because uh, if you think about uh, Kant's uh, uh, categorical imperative, the idea is uh, that uh, we need to find a universal rule of behavior that is valid for everyone. This is radically different from what uh, we find in ancient India. In ancient India, the idea is that your behavior, your duty, the idea of dharma is different for everyone. It is, uh, once again, the idea that you have to know what your place in the universe, what your place in the world is, and behave accordingly. And you shouldn't behave uh, the same way if you are a man or a woman, if you are in one of the stages of your life or in a different stage, if you belong to a, a, a family or their different family, or if you belong to a caste or to a different caste. Therefore, uh, I would like to emphasize this idea of sensitivity to the context, because uh, sometimes uh, in the past, people have uh, told that uh, you could you could not rely uh, on Indian people because sometimes they say one thing and uh, then uh, in another under another circumstances they say a, a different thing. And the reason for that uh, is here. The reason for that is that your ethics is sensitive to the uh, to the context. It depends on the context. Uh, your behavior will de uh, will be different depending on the context. You are not expected to follow the same rules for your whole life because your situation, your circumstances uh, have changed and therefore your obligations, your duties uh, uh, must be different as well. And this brings, brings us to the uh, one of the uh, fundamental uh, characteristics of uh, Indian uh, society uh, traditionally and it is the idea of caste. Uh, on this uh, diapo, I have put uh, the reference to, to caste uh, uh, in one of the most important texts uh, of Indian religion. Uh, I have already mentioned it, the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, I have also put uh, this information here about uh, the differences between caste in one of the most important legal, uh, and I would say legal, uh, texts uh, of India, the Law Code of Manu. Uh, because um, uh, I, I wanted to mention the, these two particular texts because for those of you who are interested in knowing more about uh, Indian ethics, reading the Bhagavad Gita uh, is uh, crucial and also uh, it is important to know about uh, the law code of Manu because it is uh, the, the, the most important uh, legal text uh, of ancient India. And I say legal in the sense of a, a, a book that provides uh, information not only about uh, uh, law, uh, but also about uh, the specific behavior of different uh, castes and uh, of different uh, social groups. Uh, uh, it was uh, used as a, a code, uh, for instance, during the, the British uh, domination of India, 
uh, because uh, it was very difficult to apply uh, Western and British laws to a, a society that was radically different uh, from the British society and therefore they, they needed a, 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 a basic text or a, a basic uh, a code uh, in order uh, to, to rule the, that uh, life. Before uh, discussing a bit more about castes, I would like to, you to stop to think uh, about what you uh, specifically know about castes what you have heard about caste, whether you think that castes are still alive in India or people don't pay attention to them anymore, just uh, stop uh, for a moment to think about that and then uh, uh, play uh, the video that I have put here uh, because I think it's, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to watch it uh, in order to discuss the reality uh, of uh, castes in India uh, nowadays. Well, as, as you have seen, castes are still alive in India. Uh, obviously, uh, um, they uh, pay more attention to them in rural areas of India, uh, because uh, if you are in a big city, uh, well, people don't know uh, what caste uh, you belong to. I mean, you cannot know uh, the caste uh, that the person sitting next to you uh, in the underground or in, in a public bus uh, belongs to. But uh, in a village, everyone knows uh, the caste uh, that uh, their neighbors uh, belong to. So it is more difficult to uh, not to pay attention to them. Uh, it is true also that uh, people tend to pay less and less attention to caste nowadays in India, um, but uh, they are still there. And uh, you have to know about them if you want to know about India. Uh, I have put uh, the general classification of castes here. Uh, we have the upper caste. They are called the Dwija, the twice born, because uh, the, the men belonging to this upper caste have to uh, undergo an initiation ceremony when they reach uh, puberty and this is considered to be a new uh, birth and that's why they are called uh, the twice born. Uh, the upper castes are the Brahmans or priests, the Kshatriyas or warriors and the Vaishyas, uh, uh, the caste of the merchants, cattle herders and artisans. Then we have the low caste, the servants, the Shudras, and then uh, we have the people that are even lower than the low caste, and uh, those are the Dalits, uh, the, uh, the people without a, a caste. They are considered uh, the lowest of the lowest. Uh, the division uh, between different uh, subcastes uh, is uh, very complex in India. It is different from uh, one region to the to another region, and in uh, in some regions uh, there is a multiplicity of uh, different subcastes uh, that may be uh, I don't know 18, even 30 in some parts uh, of India, and uh, these uh, subcastes um, have an impact on your everyday life because they uh, they uh, are um, uh, according to the to this uh, to this uh, subcast, uh, you can uh, perform certain tasks or do certain jobs, and you cannot uh, do other jobs. Uh, it is important to be aware that caste is not uh, the same thing as class, because uh, in every society are classes, and we find upper classes and lower classes in uh, almost every human uh, society. But the important difference is that you cannot change uh, the caste that you belong to. I mean, if you stop to think uh, for a moment uh, about uh, the, uh, I don't know, we can call it the foundational myth of uh, the United States of America, the idea is, is that uh, if, you are, if you belong to a, a lower class and you work hard and you uh, have luck and you can get rich and you can uh, become part of the, uh, the upper society. That is uh, something that uh, could not happen in ancient India, because if you are born in a caste, you are expected to keep in that caste, to stay in that caste for your whole life and to behave accordingly. Remember the idea of dharma. You have to know the, your place in the universe and behave accordingly. Therefore, if you are born as a Brahman, uh, you can uh, you cannot uh, work uh, uh, you cannot uh, buy, uh, buy and sell things you cannot uh, be a warrior uh, even if you want to uh, you have to be a priest and that's all and uh, also don't think that um, 
belonging to an upper caste automatically means that you are uh, rich because for instance some Brahmans have to take care of a small shrines uh, or small temples in rural areas of India and they are uh, they are poor uh, because they live uh, on what uh, people uh, uh, offer to them and uh, they are surrounded by poor people so they cannot be very rich uh, or if you are a Vaishya uh, you cannot uh, be a warrior and you cannot uh, be a priest. You have to stay uh, within your caste and you have to uh, behave accordingly. That's uh, the radical difference between caste and class. Class uh, basically uh, is related to wealth and uh, you can move to one uh, class to uh, another and uh, from one class to another, but you, can you cannot do that uh, with a, 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 a caste. On the other hand, uh, we have already discussed the idea of uh, the cycle of reverts and we have seen that being reborn is a punishment because you have not behaved well in your previous life, because you have not been able to uh, reach liberation. But not only that, if you have been born into a lower caste, it is your own fault because uh, you have behaved uh, uh, in a bad way in your previous life. Because if you uh, had behaved better in your previous life, probably you would have been born in an upper class. Uh, it is therefore your own fault that you are poor, that you belong to an upper class and that you are a Dalit or a Shudra. And that is cruel, but that's the usual traditional vision uh, uh, within Hinduism. Uh, it was for that reason that um, in modern times, and for instance, after uh, the, uh, the Indian independence, there were movements of Shudras and Dalits uh, that uh, shifted from uh, Hinduism to Buddhism, because in Buddhism there are no castes. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it is very difficult to uh, get uh, rid of castes, even if you uh, change a religion. Because uh, I was reading a, a, a news uh, some time ago about a Christian cemetery in, in Goa. Goa used to be a Portuguese colony and therefore the number of Christians is higher there than in other parts of India. And in a Christian cemetery there is a wall separating uh, Brahman Christians from uh, uh, Christians uh, from other uh, castes. So uh, sometimes even if you don't belong to, uh, uh, if you are not a Hindu, uh, castes are still there. Um, once again, uh, people, especially educated people, and education is getting better in India, even if there are still many, many people that don't have even the basic education, but there is an emerging important uh, growing middle class in India. People uh, have started to, to pay uh, less and less attention to caste, but they are still there. And specifically in certain areas, well, I have put here a diapo with a, a Brahman, you can see uh, this cord uh, over the shoulder, a uh, white one. This means that he has uh, undergone his initiation ceremony uh, where uh, the, the, the men belonging to the three upper classes are given this cord that they uh, will have to, um, uh, to carry uh, for their whole uh, life. Uh, nowadays, uh, basically, Brahmans uh, carry it but uh, uh, traditionally it was the three upper classes, the men of the three upper classes that uh, carried this cord with different colors and white is the color for Brahmans. Uh, I have put also this diapo with the information about what the Indian constitution says about caste because you will, heard, you will hear frequently uh, that um, um, some people say that uh, castes were banished or abolished by the Indian constitution. That is not true because uh, a constitution cannot uh, abolish uh, something religious. Uh, I mean, uh, the constitution uh, can say that uh, you cannot be discriminated according to caste. And in fact, it is what uh, the Indian constitution says that you can read on Article 15. They say the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth or any of them. And then uh, the second uh, paragraph. No citizen shall, on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, or any of them, be subject to any disability, liability, restriction, or condition with regard to access to shops, public restaurants, hotels, and places of public entertainments, and so on. So uh, the Indian Constitution uh, uh, 
banishes uh, discrimination uh, according to caste, but obviously uh, it cannot banish caste because caste, caste is a religious matter. Uh, uh, but uh, in theory, you cannot be discriminated in India uh, because of your caste. But in reality, it is not true as, as you have seen in the video that uh, you have uh, watched uh, uh, before. Uh, there, there is also uh, in India we find also programs of positive discrimination that is uh, in universities and in and in public administration. A number of uh, places are reserved for uh, a lower castes and um, and tribes uh, for uh, people uh, for uh, coming for uh, from. Um, uh, uh, tribal areas uh, in order to uh, help them to uh, have a, a better social and a better economic uh, situation. Uh, so there is a positive discrimination, but it has not gone uh, uncontested because some people uh, have uh, protested because uh, of this uh, kind of reservations in universities and in public administration. And uh, there is a, a very specially conservative area in Indian society and its marriage. Uh, this is a page of an Indian newspaper and in some Indian newspapers you can still find a section on matrimonials. And you can see that uh, you find um, uh, in, in, in red boxes uh, these names Agarwal, Visa Agarwal, Arora uh, these are uh, names of subcasts, and uh, you find under those headings uh, uh, people, specifically father, uh, 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 the parents, uh, looking for a, a husband or a wife uh, for their children uh, because they want them to marry inside the same uh, castes, the same caste. And uh, this is something that I suppose you have heard of too, because uh, uh, this happens even with uh, Indians that uh, don't live in India anymore. Uh, this happens also with Indians living in the United States or in Canada or in the, or in the United States, in the United Kingdom or in the United States, uh, because uh, um, you may have uh, um, watched uh, some movies in which... Uh, uh, there is a big problem because uh, the children have been educated in, in a Western country, let's say in the United Kingdom, but, but uh, when he or she um, uh, uh, is uh, in his or her 20s, uh, his or her parents try to find a, a sometimes a distant cousin or a, a distant relative uh, belonging to the same caste uh, for him or for her so that they marry inside the same caste. And in fact, uh, even nowadays, uh, most uh, marriages in India are arranged. Uh, in modern families, what they do is that they uh, arrange uh, that the children, the boy and the girl, um, have a meeting. And if they say that they don't like a role, then they don't force them to, to go along with the relationship. But uh, they arrange the marriages and uh, if they say, OK, we think that we can do it, then they go go on with it. Uh, I will be recommending you a, a book later in which you can read more about this because uh, this it is interesting to know that this uh, doesn't mean that the rate of divorce is higher in India than in other places or that marriages um, uh, result in, in uh, worse situations than in other places where uh, uh, marriages are not arranged. I am not uh, defending with these arranged marriages, obviously, but uh, it is a, a, an interesting point uh, to read about and to think about uh, because, uh, as I was uh, saying, uh, most uh, 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 marriages are still arranged in India uh, nowadays. Well, basically, this is uh, what uh, I wanted to uh, to focus on in this presentation, and I would like to finish uh, by um, drawing your attention to this paragraph of one of the books that I will be recommending you uh, in a moment. It is uh, I have taken uh, this paragraph from a book uh, by Barma. Uh, uh, the, the the title of the book is Being Indian. And uh, Varma uh, says that societies change, but there are limits to change. Certain traits, which are the products of centuries of conditioning, 
don't change, and it is this that provides a distinct cultural level to a people. Others can be diluted or modified, some new ones can perhaps be added, but they are mostly adds on, scaffolding on a largely unalterable edifice. And it is this combination of mostly the old and something of the new that people carry as their cultural baggages in their journey towards the future. And uh, when dealing with a culture like uh, the Indian culture, but, but also with the, Chinese, with the Chinese culture and uh, with uh, other cultures that uh, uh, have uh, deep roots in the past, we have to be aware that uh, modernity is different uh, from what uh, we uh, call modernity in the Western world, because it is the combination of mostly the old, their own tradition, with an adaptation uh, to the uh, modern world, an adaptation to this globalized uh, world in which we are living. And if we really want to understand uh, the people coming from those countries and belonging to those cultures, we have to understand uh, their cultures. And uh, I hope that uh, you will be understand a, a bit better uh, Indian culture and specifically Indian attitudes to life and Indian uh, attitudes to uh, ethics after uh, this uh, presentation. I have put here a few key points for reflection in today's world uh, because they are related uh, with uh, aspects that are different in Indian tradition and in Western tradition. The first one is, is the absence of orthodoxy and orthopraxis. Uh, when uh, discussing uh, Western uh, religions, uh, I mean, and you, you know uh, Western history very well, uh, there have been even uh, important fights uh, about uh, orthodoxy. Uh, and uh, people tend to think that there is only one appropriate way to do things. This is totally absent uh, from Indian thought. Uh, as we have seen, there are different ways of reaching liberation, but on not only that, if we had the time to go through um, uh, uh, Indian tradition in a more detailed way, we would find that uh, we generally, have, we generally, they generally have the idea that Every person has to find uh, their own uh, way. Uh, some people will find their way uh, in uh, following one practice. Some people will, will find their way in following a different practice. And all of them are acceptable. In fact, if you stoop to think about it, there is not, there is not uh, uh, something like the Indian Pope or the, the Pope of Hinduism. There are different gurus and people follow one guru or follow a different guru because uh, uh, they uh, think that uh, the, the teachings of uh, that particular guru are most suitable for them. And they don't exclude the others. They uh, assume that uh, you can uh, uh, have different approaches, that, that you can have uh, different ways uh, to uh, find uh, your own way to sacrality and your own way to reach uh, your important goals in this life. Another important idea in Hinduism is the idea of ahimsa, of non-violence. I suppose that most of you have heard about it uh, in relation to Mahatma Gandhi's uh, attitude uh, uh, because uh, he wanted uh, Indian independence but he rejected violence for achieving it. Um, this is a, a very important idea uh, because Ahimsa also covers uh, non-violence against animals because uh, for most uh, Hindus, uh, violence against animals is, uh, no, is not acceptable either. Most of them are vegetarians, not all of them because uh, 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 some of them eat uh, uh, meat, not uh, cow meat obviously, but uh, other kinds of meat, but um, this idea of ahimsa uh, can be also understood at different levels and it is the, the idea of trying to avoid violence as uh, much as uh, you can. Um, connected to that, it is the idea of fraternity between all living beings, uh, because uh, for certain uh, Hindus, um, reincarnation uh, also embraces uh, animals. Uh, that is, uh, you can be reborn not only as a human being, but also as a different animal. And therefore, all the living, all living beings are, um, uh, are brothers, and uh, we should try uh, 
uh, to uh, have respect and consideration towards them and not only towards our fellow uh, human beings. And finally, I think that uh, this notion of dharma as knowing one's position in the universe and behaving accordingly to it, uh, it is also very important, not in the sense that you cannot escape your destiny as in, in the castes, but the idea of uh, the humanity that uh, we humans must uh, uh, be aware that we are not the lords of the universe, but uh, uh, instead uh, we have to assume that we belong in the universe and we have to behave according to our, our position in that universe. And so, uh, when uh, if you stop to think about uh, this, uh, this uh, perspective is... Uh, radically different from the one that we adopt a lot of time when facing important problems such as the ones that we have to face nowadays uh, with pollution, uh, with um, um, uh, pandemics and with uh, many uh, urgent and pressing issues uh, nowadays. And uh, the Hindu perspective can help us uh, to focus this from uh, new points of view and understanding uh, and finding uh, new ways to solve these problems uh, uh, from a new perspective and uh, with uh, new insights. And um, I will um, I, uh, I will uh, now recommend you a few books. Uh, if you are going to read just one book in your whole life uh, about uh, uh, modern India, about uh, India today, uh, I recommend you to read this book, The Indian's Portrait of a People. There is also a Spanish translation for those of you who prefer to read it in Spanish, and the translation is very good. Uh, it was founded by uh, the, the the translation. I mean, it uh, was uh, financed by the by Casa uh, de Asia, an, an institution of the Spanish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So the translation is very good. But uh, if you are going to read only one book about India, please uh, read this one: The Indian's Portrait of a People by Sudhir Kakar and Katarina Kakar. Uh, because uh, it is very informative, it's about uh, 200 pages long and uh, it is really, really interesting. You will understand much better India after reading this book. Then if you, go, if you want to read a, a bit more, I recommend you to read uh, these two books uh, about Hinduism, uh, Introducing Hinduism by Hilary Rodriguez or uh, Hinduism uh, by Sibel Shatuk. Uh, the first one, uh, the one by Hilary Rodriguez, is uh, uh, longer, and uh, the 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 one by Sibel Shatuk is uh, is a kind of booklet. It's very thin. It's uh, about uh, 40, 50 pages, but you can uh, get the fundamentals. You can uh, get the the basic information about Hinduism, and it's uh, a very, very uh, good uh, summary of the most important information about Hinduism and its history. And I also recommend you uh, these two books, uh, Gavin Flood's uh, An Introduction to Hinduism. It is also a very good book. Uh, that provides uh, an overview of Hinduism uh, over the history. And uh, this is the book I have mentioned uh, in the diapos, uh, The Laws of Manu, uh, or The Law Code of Manu. It depends on the translation. It is uh, the classical uh, treaty, uh, the, the classical manual uh, of Indian uh, legal thought and uh, an important source of information about the, the behavior of uh, the different uh, castes and uh, the different social groups in uh, classical uh, India. So if you want to know more about uh, the, the roots of the Indian thought, it is a very important uh, book. Please use a good translation because there are no good translations into Spanish, no direct translations. So if you can read it in English and, for instance, uh, in this Penguin's edition, um, read, uh, read it. But please use a good translation because sometimes um, some of the translations that uh, you can find uh, to Spanish and to other languages are not so reliable. And this is all. I think uh, I hope that um, uh, you have enjoyed uh, this presentation and that you know uh, a bit more about Hinduism and Hindu ethics uh, now, uh, now after uh, my presentation. Greetings to all and thank you for your attention.